welcome. I'm Karat Mayer. Welcome to the Financial Planning Experts' first webinar for, for 2024. As Sandra mentioned, we, we're hoping to bring you something different and interesting this morning. Uh, one of the things that I encounter advisors are seeing a lot of late relates to tax questions and clients wanting to go offshore, either to invest offshore, offshore, set up uh, property offshore. So this morning we're going to ask uh, ask our two groups of speakers. Firstly, Dai from uh, from Bazaars, and secondly, Axie and Vera from Rogers Capital to talk to us from Dai's perspective about a couple of tricky and interesting tax situations that financial advisors and their clients find themselves in. Now, the purpose of Dai's talk is not to not to teach all of us to be tax practitioners in the next forty five minutes. The purpose is to highlight some interesting things so that you are enabled to highlight some similar. Uh, to your class so that you could spot those things happening, maybe call in the likes of a die or another specialist to, to assist you with that. Following Dai, um, I'll introduce you to uh, to Vera and Ansi, whom you can see on your screen. They're from Rogers Capital in Mauritius. Once Dai is able to set sort of a general scene, we're going to zoom in on uh, on the Mauritian uh, Mauritian situation and position. So colleagues, without further ado, if uh, you to die. I'm going to ask that you post questions in the Q&A box. I think Sandra might have mentioned that. My job is to make sure that I have a look at those. And at the end of the session, I will pose those questions to her. If we don't get through all of them, we might get around to sending out a little circular or note of how those goes. Apologies again for the camera being off, but at least my voice carries this way. Dai, let me hand over to you. Thank you so much for being here. Good morning, everybody. And it really is really nice to join you guys. And so strange to have our Mauritian team with us because I cannot tell you from a South African planning spotlight or set point of view is that we've had a vast interest in Mauritius again. Everybody was moaning Guernsey, Guernsey, Guernsey. And honestly, Mauritius has come up as a big, big source of interest again. So that really to have that team with us today and to get their information is going to be invaluable. But we need to look at some tax stuff. So what I'm going to do is share my screen with you. And then I can just chat a little bit, tiny bit further about myself. Because what I've put together for you is just a little workbook, which we will happily circulate once the session is finished with today. And for myself, as Gerard said, my name is Dar Sikkim. I am with our tax consulting team at what we call now Forvis Mazars. We've got a new name. And what we are finding is two schools of thought at the moment. Number one is that we want to be very careful that in respect of any tax planning, we don't just follow a trend and undo some very good, valuable options we have back here in South Africa. So we want to almost benefit by both. We want to have that offshore exposure, have it tax efficiently, have it sensibly, but we've also got to be very honest that even if you are thinking of leaving South Africa, what of our investments here in South Africa still make very good sense? And if we do decide to leave or stay in South Africa, what are these kinds of things that we want to be thinking about? So, ladies and gents, I always just remind people, and if you do get the workbook and are listening to the recording of our session, then I always remind people, this is on page two, of to just be aware of our tax rates, our tax rates. You know, we get so lazy as individuals, and I know that a lot of the taxpayers we deal with are high net worth individuals, but it's always worth remembering that if we look at our income tax table, and as we know, sadly, we've had no change in this one between 24 and 25, but we're very lazy to say, oh, top tax bracket, 45% tax, 45% tax, which internationally, <clears throat> excuse me, bending too much presenting, which internationally is a high rate. But can I ask you to always remember that our individual tax tables have two tax rates, two tax rates, our average rate, and then of course our marginal rate. So even just to make that point in a very top tax table, the very top bracket of our tax table. Remember that the average rate for this table is just, just over 35%. And so what we are instinctively saying there is every cent of taxable income up to that amount of 1.8 million odd, every cent of taxable income just up to the top 
tax bracket where it starts at 1.8 million odd. The tax payable on every cent of taxable income below that is 35.4%. It's only every cent of taxable income above your 1.8 million that you then start triggering the 45% tax. Now, why is this important? Because where you sit on the income tax table also directly impacts your capital gains tax you're going to pay. So if you do decide you potentially want to leave South Africa and you do have assets that remain in South Africa and there will be a disposal of those assets and we're going to talk about your one asset in particular and you've got to understand the lower you are in the tax table, the lower effective capital gains tax we will pay. So in South Africa, our capital gains tax effectively at the end of the day can be anywhere between 7.2 and 18% capital gains tax. So this is where we always just start thinking about saying to people, if you are thinking potentially of leaving South Africa yourself and you are then paying lower taxes in South Africa, as we'll take a look at, you lower on the tax bracket, that will also indicate that if you are going to be liable for capital gains tax in South Africa once you've left us, that'll be quite a low rate of capital gains tax because you're quite low on our natural person's tax table. But ladies and gents, Let's look at a couple of things that we want to turn around and say, you know, are there some South African assets, just general investment strategies, assets, which still make quite a lot of sense, even for individuals who require a little bit of flexibility. And by that, I mean not diversifying your investment base between local investments and offshore, but by that, I mean, you know what? I don't know that I am going to end up living in South Africa until the day I pass away. I might be in a situation where I'm a young professional and I want to go and see what life is like outside South Africa and maybe make a life out of South Africa or not. Or ladies and gents, I'm a retiree and I've got children who now reside offshore and they're trying to convince me so much that they love me to death. Meantime, all they've worked out is how expensive daycare and childminders are in the country where they now live and they need assistance keeping the house clean. So what if I'm a retiree in South Africa and I then think, you know what, maybe one day I will leave and go and live with my children in the country where they've taken up residence. So ladies and gents, all I want us to be careful of is, and we're going to come and have a look on our way through to page five, page five in our information, is I want us to please just remember that we have on page five, as most countries do, a very strong definition around being a tax resident to South Africa. And this concept of residence, people are slowly, slowly getting used to it, but we're still not finding ourselves that comfortable when it comes to this idea of tax residence, tax residence. Because, ladies and gents, it is a concept that is defined in our Income Tax Act, in our Income Tax Act. So, so often people are still getting hold of me and saying, oh, da, I'm here and I've got property in South Africa, but I left six years ago because I have property in South Africa. Am I still resident to South Africa? Or vice versa, I've been working in Dubai for a number of years. Does that make me tax resident in Dubai? So ladies and gents, there are very, very strong tax definitions around the concept of resident. And to just simplify part of the story so that we can deal with just some aspects of what we need to think about, one of our tests of whether you are tax resident to South Africa is whether you are ordinarily resident in the Republic. And ordinarily resident in the Republic simply means that overall, if I balance up everything in your life, your home, your family, your investments, your activities, your intentions, is South Africa your true or main home? Because ladies and gents, on a simple side, if I can find an individual who is ordinarily resident to South Africa, then I can find them tax resident here, tax resident here. 
Now, we know there are certain exceptions when it comes to double taxation agreements, but that's way beyond the scope of today and just how we want to think through some of the big issues in respect of our individuals and what assets they should keep, what they should sell if they're thinking of maybe one day leaving South Africa. Now, if South Africa is your true or main home. So you might go overseas for specific work projects and come back. You might have periods where you're not in South Africa, but at the end of the day, overall, South Africa is your true or main home. We said that we regard you as tax resident, tax resident. So the reason why, ladies and gents, immigration has become such a big deal, and please, I am truly of the firm belief that if people cannot spell immigration, they should not be allowed to do it. When you immigrate, you exit a country, so it's immigrate with an E. Now, the reason why immigration has become such a big deal, ladies and gents, is because Immigration means I, as an individual, am doing everything legally, everything in terms of the various countries' legislation to show that I'm going to make another country my true or main home. Now, please, if there are any of you who have got those words financial immigration bouncing around in your head at the moment, stop that immediately. Financial immigration does not even exist anymore. It's a reserve bank issue, was, doesn't even exist anymore, like I said, and it's not a tax issue. So immigration, when I get on a plane to leave South Africa for good because I've filed all my visas and my applications for residence and my tax status and looking for new employment and moving families and buying family homes, etc., and immigration is simply the most simple way, not the only way, but the most simple way of saying, South Africa, you're no longer my true or main home. In fact, I'm going to be ordinarily resident somewhere else. And once that happens and I immigrate from South Africa, I leave South Africa, I go and take up my life permanently in another country. What happens is, for tax purposes, this breaks our tax residence. So what happens is, we're going from being resident to South Africa for tax purposes, and then we become non-resident. Now, in that tax year, when you break tax residence, for example, you immigrate, proof, objective proof saying, South Africa, you're no longer my true or main home, in that tax year, we get a tax consequence, very, very nasty tax consequence from a liquidity point of view in terms of Section 9H. Section 9H. Now, ladies and gents, here's the important thing. I don't care, and we're just going to go towards the bottom of page number five. I don't care whether you are looking at somebody who financially emigrated, etc., with the Reserve Bank. I don't care. I still have to, in a tax year, when a taxpayer breaks their tax residence, financial immigration had nothing to do with it. But if, for example, in the normal dictionary sense of the word, we immigrate, we show South Africa, hey, you're no longer my true or main home. I'm no longer ordinarily resident here. And we break tax residence. We will be required to go onto our e-filing system on the SARS platform. And on the REV1 form, we will give SARS a day, a month, and a year. A day, a month, and a year that we broke tax residence. Now, the reason why we're using the example of somebody immigrating is because the day, the month, and the year that this person broke tax residence is fairly easy to establish. Let us pretend on the 24th of September 2023, you got on the plane to leave for the last time. And if we are responsible for giving SARS a day, a month and a year, we can say, SARS, this is the day I got on the plane for the last time, left South Africa to go and start my life in another country, and I broke tax residence on the 24th of September. Because you see, ladies and gents, all the drama actually happens the day before you break tax residence.
And the reason for that is because section 9H is such a mean section. It's going to take most of the assets you own and it's going to pretend that you disposed of those assets for an amount equal to whatever the market value of those assets was the day before you broke tax residence. So if in our little example, you break tax residence on the 24th of September and our the day before that, 23 September, I am going to look at all your qualifying assets. Remember, these haven't really been disposed of. I don't have to deem a disposal of something you actually sold. But ladies and gents, for those assets that you choose to keep ownership of, you've got wonderful share portfolios in South Africa. You've got REITs you've invested in in South Africa. You've got unit trusts that you want to keep here. You've got offshore unit trusts that you've acquired. You've got offshore properties and local properties in South Africa. But for all those qualifying assets that you do not actually sell, I'm going to take each one and I'm going to pretend you sold it for proceeds and amount equal to the market value of that asset on the 23rd September. I'm going to take off the actual base cost of each of these assets and I'm going to add up a fat gain for you to have to have as a tax consequence and that gain will be triggered the day before you cease being resident. So ladies and gents, it's a massive deal when we cease to be tax resident because of the liquidity. We don't want to go and dispose of these assets we've invested in, but assets that we house in our own name are potentially vulnerable to having this doom disposal where South Africa says, right, I'm going to tax you as if you had sold them so I can catch you on the capital growth in that asset between when you acquired it, base cost, and its value the day you, before you cease being resident. I'm going to catch you on that. Now, there are three big assets that are excluded. There are three big assets that are excluded. Number one is South African immovable property. Now, you're going to hear that acquiring immovable property in a foreign country is often a very important step to getting certain tax benefits and certain rights to live, etc., in those countries. But ladies and gents, if you acquire that property in your own name and you cease to be resident to South Africa, you're going to have a deemed disposal of foreign immovable property. But there will be no deemed disposal of your South African immovable property. And just keeping property in South Africa, keeping assets in South Africa, having family in South Africa, doesn't tell you pull you back to being a resident. By you emigrating to a foreign country, you're saying, yeah, SA, I'm leaving some stuff behind, but you're no longer my true or main home. You will also have no deemed disposal in terms of any interest you have in an SA retirement fund. So this will mainly be our retirement annuity funds because a lot of people who are immigrating would have cashed out from their employment, pension or provident funds. But if you have a fund and you haven't cashed out, you will have no deemed disposal. And a big one for us, ladies and gents, SA insurer owned long term insurance policies, SA insurer owned. And these will include both a local endowment or sinking fund and, and, and an offshore endowment or sinking fund. So if you, via an SA insurer, have invested in an offshore endowment, and we know a lot of our big SA insurers are offering them now, you will have no deemed disposal of that endowment when you cease to be resident. You'll have no tax consequences like you would have in respect of other assets that you own local share portfolios, offshore share portfolios, local unit trusts, local REITs, etc. So this is where we have to start paying attention to our next speaker because these disposals are happening not in respect of our three excluded assets here, but in respect of our other assets. These deemed disposals are happening because we own these assets in our own name. They were not acquired and held in either an SA trust or not acquired by a foreign trust, a foreign trust. 
So ladies and gents, when we do look at assets that we hold in our own name, we want to be careful as always of any deemed disposal of those assets in respect of a liquidity, because deemed disposal means you didn't really sell, but the tax they want is real and you got to cough up with the cash to pay Mr. Sars. Now, if we just want to briefly, briefly chat about this whole idea of us breaking tax residence, let's just come and have a look at page eight, page eight. And on page eight, ladies and gents, what we do just remind ourselves is, is that once a taxpayer has no longer been regarded as is a tax resident, for example, they've immigrated to another country and they are now non-resident. We have loads of South Africans who are still shareholders in South African companies. And I mean shareholders in private companies. We've got loads of South Africans who still are invested in our JSE, either directly via equities or via unit trusts. So ladies and gents, just remember once you are non-resident and you get paid a dividend from any equity investment in South Africa, be it a shareholding in a private company, be it a shareholding in the listed environment, and you get a dividend, what we will do now is we will see that South Africa is now paying a dividend, but to a non-resident, because remember, you are no longer tax resident to us. We've broken tax resident with you. You are resident in another country. And very, very often what we pay particular attention to is, is that South Africa has double tax agreements with many, many, many countries, including Mauritius. We have a great double tax agreement with Mauritius. But South Africa has double taxation agreements with many countries. And sometimes when we look at those double taxation agreements, it says to South Africa, uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. When you want to pay a dividend to a shareholder that is now non-resident, I don't care if it's private company shares, I don't care if it's listed equity on our JSC, the double taxation agreement might say, hey, 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 listen you, South Africa, you can't take off a 20% withholding tax, you can only take off 15, or South Africa, you can only take off 10. So in many instances, where South Africans who have broken tax residence and are now non-resident, are receiving these amounts generated from South African assets, from South African investments, from South African properties, because these amounts are seen to be from a South African source, and if I become non-resident, I can't tax you on everything in South Africa anymore. I can only tax you on these amounts that come from a South African source. The assets are located in South Africa. The investment is in South Africa. So like I said, very common for non-residents to earn SA dividend source share. And the dividend tax they get taken off of those dividends is dictated by a double taxation agreement. But ladies and gents, let me tell you, one of the most efficient income streams for a non-resident to earn from South Africa, because either the money is invested here or the debt is here, is SA interest. SA interest. Ladies and gents, if you are going to be taxed in terms of SA interest that you are getting as a non-resident. So as I say, you might still have loans to your companies here. You might still have loans to your trusts here. You might have big government bonds you invested in. So you earning South African interest, why do you care about it? Because the asset generating it, the debt generating it, the debt generating it is in South Africa. So the interest is sourced here. And now that you're non-resident, I can tax you on a source basis. Now, for most, for most individuals, they are looking at the worst case scenario of a 15% withholding tax on their interest. Worst case scenario. And why do I say worst case scenario? Because, ladies and gents, if I just page you on a few pages forward to page 11, page 11. So for most non-residents, most non-residents, and we just come and have a look on page 11, page, oh, sorry, page 12, page 12. 
for most non-residents earning SA sourced interest. Our law says hey, South Africa is going to take off a 15% dividend, I'm um, sorry, a 15% withholding tax on the interest paid to you from your loan to your local company, your loan to your local trust. But here is on page 11 an excerpt from our double taxation agreement with Australia. And Australia right here says, oh no, you don't, South Africa, oh no, you don't. You can take off 10% of any interest SA source. You can take off a 10% withholding tax, but certainly not your 15. Now, what we're going to do is jump back to page 8. We're going to jump back to page 8 because this is such a big deal. What other tax does an individual pay, <clears throat> excuse me, on SA interest sourced in South Africa? Well, ladies and gents, there is very often no more normal tax to pay because if we jump back to page eight, an individual, if they can just show in the 12 months before the interest accrued to them that they were not in South Africa more than 183 days. So Mr. Non-Resident emigrated to Australia, got massive investments here, earning SA interest, loans to SA companies, loans to the trusts, loans to government bond investors, fixed deposits, big SA interest being paid because our interest is so high, that interest is sourced here. Maybe subject to a withholding tax, but already the DTA says, uh -uh, not 15, only 10. But what other normal tax? Nothing. If that non-resident can show in the 12 months before they received that interest, they were not in South Africa more than 183 days, they get no more tax on that interest. And now, and now look at this. Look at this on page number nine. Ladies and gents, if that SA sourced interest, so it's coming from money invested in SA, if that interest is coming from our government, our banks, or our listed debt, like listed debentures on our JSC, then there isn't even any withholding tax. Now listen carefully. If there's no withholding tax, and you haven't been in SA more than 183 days in the 12 months before this interest accrued to you, there is no tax. Nada, nada, nada. So we have this fantastic set of sections in our law which say that a non-resident earning SA sourced interest, particularly from government bonds, from fixed deposits, money markets in our banks, or from listed debentures, for example, on our JSE, you get no, no, no withholding tax. Not DTA, nothing. Our law says no withholding tax. And you will get no normal tax because you were not in SA more than 183 days in the 12 months before those monies accrued. So we keep this exemption in place so that South Africans, well, oh, sorry, sorry, so that people once they've left SA will keep investing monies into SA and make such tax efficient earnings of our SA interest. Now, ladies and gents, just so you know that it's there because it's so funny how these things happen. You can see that a lot of South Africans who chose to emigrate just after COVID and that was all relaxed and they started becoming uncertain about our recent election and you'll see that they emigrated from South Africa and we said that one of the assets you don't have a deemed disposal of is South African immovable property and we don't care what that property is as long as you own it I don't care if it's commercial property rental property was your primary home I don't care all I want you to know is, is that we're starting to see that South Africans have emigrated who wanted to keep their South African properties and come back and visit or rent them out, particularly in northern KZN and Cape Town. The rentals are unbelievably good. They are now having to sell those properties to fund further lifestyle changes where they are living because it's a lot more expensive than they thought. And all I want you to know, ladies and gents, is once you are non-resident, the one asset that we can still catch you on for capital gains tax is when you sell your South African immovable property. And the way we do that is when the purchaser pays you, the seller, you now non-resident, selling your South African property, 
when the purchaser pays you, the seller, the purchaser has to take off at least some of the purchase price if you're selling your property for more than $2 million. And let's face it, these days, $2 million is almost just, just about covering the loom in each property. So if you are a non-resident selling South African immovable property, whoever purchases it from you must take off a percentage of the purchase price and give that to SARS as a prepayment towards the taxes that you owe. And if you, the seller, are an individual, the purchaser will take off 7.5% of the purchase price and they will then give that to SARS. Now, ladies and gents, another big thing I want to talk about, because I'm sorry, there is very little you can say that is negative about our retirement funds, our retirement funds. So I want us to just calm down. We've had a huge drama with two pots and am I going to take out what's in my savings pot, et cetera, et cetera. But ladies and gents, we need to take a step back from all of that because when we are talking, and we're going to be on page 13 of our little workbook now, should you refer back to a recording or the workbook, when we look at our retirement funds, particularly with persons who may be thinking of leaving SA, one of the most relevant funds for them, of course, is the retirement annuity fund. And the only reason I say that, ladies and gents, is because if we are a member of an employer's pension or provident fund, chances are if we leave South Africa, we will leave that employment and then cash out of our monies in that fund. So what we want to do is just say, but hang on, hang on, hang on. There are a lot of South Africans who leave SA and are still members of retirement funds in South Africa. Ladies and gents, you cannot, cannot underestimate tax-free growth within the fund vehicle itself. You simply cannot underestimate that. And then also the deductibility of the contributions we make to the fund. So lots of people say to me, oh, da, we're leaving SA, but we've still got a retirement annuity fund with SA. What's going to happen? Can we keep contributing? Should we keep contributing? What's the big deal? Well, what I want you to think about just to get our thoughts around everything is I want you to think about the contributions made annually. So ladies and gents, we know that when we make our contributions to our retirement funds, roughly, roughly to a maximum of 350000 maximum, we generally work out how much of the contribution we can deduct by working out 27.5% of our taxable income each year, just as a rough guide. Now, I want you to think about it. If you become non-resident, and I can't tax you on your worldwide amounts anymore, we can only tax you on these essay sourced amounts, amounts coming from your rental property in South Africa, amounts coming from interest generated here, and those types of amounts. Your taxable income, once you stop being resident here, is going to be extremely small, if anything, because we saw how even some of your local interest, if not all of it, is free, 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 free from normal tax. So, ladies and gents, it's very common that if you leave SA, you have not had a deemed disposal in respect of your membership of your retirement fund, which is fantastic, and you keep contributing, chances are that those contributions will simply grow and be carried forward, grow and be carried forward, grow and be carried forward as disallowed contributions for no other reason than your taxable income here might be nothing or very, very low. So what do we remember? We remember that if we have a look on page 14, on page 14, we actually have a very, very strict set of rules. Oh, sorry, I'm going to jump you back a little bit. I'm going to jump you back. My apologies. Let's have a look. Oh, we are on page 14, right? So we have very strict rules that if I have contributed to my retirement fund and I have contributions that I've not been able to deduct for tax purposes, then, ladies and gents, those roll forward and roll forward and roll forward. 
How do I get to use those? How do I get to use those? Well, ladies and gents, if you are already in receipt of a qualifying annuity, what we used to call a compulsory annuity. So let's say, for example, I've got somebody who was a member of their employer's provident fund. Or no, I mean, no, actually, let me rather use pension fund. Just keep us clear. I've got someone who was a member of their employer's pension fund and they're a member of a retirement annuity fund. They, in, they retired from their employment with that employer. They took one third of their monies in their pension fund as a lump sum and they had to use the other thirds to fund that compulsory or what we now call qualifying annuity. Living annuity, life annuity, I don't care. Now, if you are contributing to your retirement annuity fund and you are not able to deduct those contributions, then they can be set off against your compulsory annuity or qualifying annuity and make portions, if not all, of your qualifying annuity tax-free. But ladies and gents, we've also got to be careful because the law says to us that the moment you get a lump sum from a fund. Your, your disallowed contributions that you're carrying forward, they must be set off against that lump sum. So if you haven't gotten a lump sum because you haven't yet gotten anything from your RA, but you're getting this compulsory qualifying annuity living or life annuity from your pension fund membership, then these excessive RA contributions you're still making can be eating up that compulsory annuity. But now you decide it's time for you to get some money from that RA that you're invested in. So number one, don't think your contributions are not tax efficient, but let's also look at something that we see based on page 18, 18, page 18. Now, ladies and gents, here's the deal. Let's go, oh, my apologies, on your slides, it'll be page 19. Now, let's have a look at this and let's be careful. Let's be very, very careful. And as I say, I'm going to do this example with the retirement annuity fund, not because it doesn't apply to the other funds, but just RAs are our most common that people who've left South Africa tend to stay invested in. Why? Well, ladies and gents, what we have for all our retirement funds is what's called the new three-year rule. The new three-year rule. And what this means is the following. If I can prove to SARS that I have not been tax resident for three consecutive continuous years, not been tax resident for three consecutive continuous years. So if I recall correctly, we said that our taxpayer broke tax residence when they got on the plane on the 24th of September, 2023. So literally on the 24th of September, 2026, they would have been able to prove to SARS that they have not been tax resident for three continuous consecutive years. Now, how will SARS know that? Because you went onto that form and told SARS the day, the month, and the year that you ceased to be tax resident. Now, please, 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 this bit we must understand. We must understand. If you want to make use of the three-year rule, you must not yet have retired from the relevant fund we're looking at. So let's look at our taxpayer who was a member of their employer's pension fund. They retired from that fund. They got some monies as a lump sum and the rest went in to create that compulsory or what we now call qualifying living or life annuity. That taxpayer has retired from that fund, but they have an RA that they are contributing to. Now, if that taxpayer has not yet retired from the RA, they have not elected to retire, and they can say to SARS, SARS, I have not been tax resident for at least three continuous consecutive years. 
then that taxpayer can withdraw all the monies out of their RA. They will withdraw it in terms of our new system. Everything can be withdrawn out of the vested component. Everything can be withdrawn out of the retirement component. We can withdraw out of the savings component anytime we want. You don't have to wait for three years. But for a retirement fund, in our example, a retirement annuity, because they have not yet elected to retire from the fund, they can elect because they've been non-resident three consecutive continuous years, they did their paperwork with SARS, to withdraw everything sitting in their retirement fund. And that means that they can then take out everything invested component as a lump sum and everything in their invested um, component and retirement component. But the flip side is one bit of good news, one bit of bad news. All those disallowed contributions that we weren't able to deduct, they will come off the lump sum before we tax it, before we tax it. And ladies and gents, whatever's left over, however, goes into that less efficient withdrawal lump sum tax table. So that's a bit of a downside. But now what about the poor taxpayer who's already receiving their pension from their employer's pension fund? Ladies and gents, what if this is the mum who's been convinced by her dreadful children to go and live with them in Australia and to look after the kids and clean the house? She's able, like we said, once she's been non-resident three consecutive continuous years, to clear out everything in her RA, both what's sitting invested and retirement, take off her disallowed contributions and be taxed in terms of the withdrawal lump sum table, lump sum table but what about that annuity coming from her pension fund membership? Ladies and gents, that we cannot unlock for you. We will work out what we're going to tax you on that in terms of PAYE. We will pay it in rands into your bank account and it will be taxed in the offshore jurisdiction. And then we'll see what relief we can get you if you are being double taxed. Now, ladies and gents, just before I finish off, just before I finish off, can I just ask you, please, 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 to just highlight for yourself just some information that is set out on page 21, page 21. Now, this is effective right now from the 2025 tax year. So take a breath. It's not the trust returns we're submitting now, which are 2024. This is the tax year we're in now, 2025. Now, remember, please, we said that we get protected from a lot of deemed disposals of assets. Sometimes when we immigrate, for example, sometimes when we die is another deemed disposal. We get a lot of protection when those assets sit in a trust and not in our name as an individual. Well, all I just want to remind you of, all I want you to remind you of is please, 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 those of you who've set up your SA trusts, we're going to find that from 2025 onwards, so from 1 March this year, we're going to only, only have an efficiency with our trusts where our beneficiaries are tax resident here. So we know lots of resident beneficiaries have left South Africa. They're now non-resident beneficiaries of our trusts. And ladies and gents, we will no longer be able to use the flow through principle, just like we couldn't flow capital gains to them in the past. We will now not be able to flow income through to them. And those amounts then could potentially be taxed in our SA trust at our highest rates. So as much as we like trust and we did a lot of tax planning with our SA trust, we just got to be big be careful of big changes like this and what that can mean for our future tax planning. But I'm going to stop, stop sharing my screen with you now to see if anyone's still awake or if we've got any questions. Uh, thank you so much. I think that's, <clears throat> that's super informative. And I've got that coming through on messages as well. Everybody appreciating very, very much. If we can just quickly, quickly touch on two clarifying questions that... Yeah. That a colleague has asked, and I think it's something that I'm seeing in industry quite a bit. Uh, advisors are looking and clients at the two-part system and saying, 
oh my gosh, two part has come in. I'm sure it has changed a whole lot of stuff. And my general starting point has been, it's introduced a few things, but a whole lot of the rules have stayed the same. Yeah. I just want to test with you, what has Tupac changed, if anything, when a client immigrates with an E? Absolutely nothing, um, except, except, should I say, that what they're going to do is, remember your vested component, we're going to treat exactly like we always have. So your vested component, once you've been out three years, can be pulled out in full, provided you haven't retired from the fund. Then what they've said is, okay, your savings component, we're not making special rules for, because your savings component, as long as there's 2,000 Rand there, take it when you like, but I'm going to make you pay full tax on it. So whether you're a resident taking out your savings, don't do it, it's stupid. Or you're a non-resident taking out your savings, same insult, don't do it, you're going to pay full tax on it. It's in respect of your vest, um, sorry, your retirement component that they will allow the three-year rule to apply as well. So any monies built up in your retirement component, as we know, are tricky to get out of there as a lump sum. Right now, I have to die or go and live outside SA and be non-resident for three years in a row. And then what's in your retirement component will also sadly go into the withdrawal lump sum. So full tax for savings, wait three years to be non-resident, at least three continuous, and then you can access everything invested and everything in retirement, but retirement lump sum table. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Di. And just one last clarifying question, then we're going to focus on Mauritius after that. Um, you mentioned the benefit of there being no deemed disposal on a South African long-term policy. And then you mentioned as well, which I think is very important for our advisors and our clients, that we've got local long-term insurers who open branches offshore. The okay. other option is an actual foreign insurer who comes and does business here. Maybe just 30 seconds on the difference, please, if you don't mind. I think there the main difference is if you want that flexibility that I want some offshore exposure now, but I'm not sure where I'm going to be. Or I've got foreign beneficiaries. I'm going to live in South Africa, but when I die, I want the proceeds from my endowment to go to a foreign beneficiary because my daughter's in the UK or in Oz, etc. Then you've got to look at how that SA endowment works for you, whether it's a local endowment or foreign endowment that the SA insurer has set up. Because the 12% tax in that vehicle is unbelievably cheap. But then you have to say, but what happens to the person who gets it in Australia, in the UK, et cetera, on my passing? And the other side of that is, if you go through a genuine offshore endowment structure and you go into their vehicle, we can't be sure what the tax rates are in the vehicle for the different endowments. Mm. I just don't know. And then also, should you, as the policyholder, cease to be resident or pass away? you will have a deemed disposal of that policy. So you've got to weigh that up against the efficiency of saying, listen, I've got a flexibility now. If I pass away with an SA insurer endowment, no capital gains tax. If I cease to be resident, no capital gains tax. But then what are the consequences of it paying out in a beneficiary's foreign country versus me having that actual policy with a non-SA insurer, CGT for death, CGT if you stop being resident, and what are the consequences when it pays out? No country's tax-free. In fact, we're working out that a lot are much, much worse than us. Much worse. That's almost a nice thing to hear. I think, guys, thank you. So, thank you. Thank you so much. I think, colleagues, it just shows yet again with guys' last answer as well how important it is when we do financial advisory planning to think of the suitability of a product. And tax is a critical component of that, that steers that. And of course, as you guys know, there's also a lot that uh, that's driven by the client's needs and goals. There's a lot of things to, to think about. So when the client now sits in front of you and the client talks about all these tax things and the client is considering immigrating, Dai's given us some food for thought. There's a lot to keep in mind. My advice is always to get hold of someone like Dai, a tax practitioner, ask him to help. I think what I've seen is really, really important is that one needs to have a holistic view of a client's tax position. It's very dangerous to say to a client, this is how this slice works without understanding the rest. Now, let's say that client wants to go to Mauritius. The client's interested in Mauritius. That's what our, our next two guests are going to talk about. 
So I'm going to hand straight over to Vera and Ansi. They're joining us from Rogers Capital in Mauritius. I'm asking that you just give us 30 seconds in between slides. Sometimes there's a slight lag over the link. That's not a big deal. So Vera and Ansi, welcome. We're looking forward to, to hear what you have to say to us. Thank you so much. Uh, Vera, you're on mute. And then I'm just going to ask if Di can take her slides down, her stop share, please. I've stopped sharing from my side. Uh, okay, so I'm just going to have a look here. Yeah, are you also still able to see um, the slides? Uh, yes, I can see Di's slides, yeah. Okay. Do you want see. to maybe just try and share the new ones? Um, yep. Because as I say, mine is going to share again. I've, I've unshared, but maybe Thanks. they go off the screen with the new ones. Thanks, Di. Yeah, let's, from your side, yeah, apologies for that. There we are. I think that's coming up now. All right, that's better. Looks good. Thanks, Bea. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, I am Vera Bergen, a senior manager in the business development team in uh, Rogers Capital in Mauritius. It is a great pleasure for us to be here today to talk to you about the various business solutions and products that we can offer to foreign individuals and foreign entities to structure efficiently in Mauritius. Following all the interesting taxation facts that Diane just covered and the reality of the, of the tax consequences for an individual holding assets in his or her personal name, and also the fact that more and more SA South African tax residents are showing interest to, uh, to, to restructure in Mauritius, I am hoping that my colleague and I can fill in some gaps, provide some estate planning solutions, and answer some of the questions about effective wealth planning for individuals. Uh, Rogers Capital is a licensed management company in Mauritius. We are one of the leading service providers of uh, fiduciary services, company administration, client accounting, trust administration, payroll and outsourcing um, activities. We have been operating for about, for all, over 30 years actually, we have a team of professionals of 250 with a mix of professional accountants, administrators, and, and company secretaries who look after our, all, all our structures. We also have our own in-house legal and tax team, which assist our foreign clients with uh, efficient structuring solutions in Mauritius. We are part of a listed group here in Mauritius, namely the Rogers Group. Rogers Group is an international group headquartered in Mauritius. It is listed on the stock exchange of Mauritius. And uh, we have a diversified business activity segments, which, which cover five segments, namely finance and technology, hospitality and travel, logistics, malls, real estate and agribusiness. We have been in existence for over 125 years. Uh, Rogers Group has a workforce of 4,700 employees and we are present in about 12 countries. I will now hand over to my colleague Ansi, who will give you an overview of why Mauritius is an attractive jurisdiction for foreigners and also uh, foreign entities. Thank you, Vera. Good morning, everyone. It is a pleasure to be on this webinar with you. During the course of this webinar, we are going to look at the various offers in Mauritius. But to start with, I'll just give you a brief highlights of the advantages of doing business in Mauritius. First of all, Mauritius emerges as a preferred jurisdiction for business and an ideal platform for structuring investments. The country holds the top rank in ease of doing business in Africa. Mauritius provides for both fiscal and non-fiscal benefits, imposes no withholding tax on distribution to shareholders and has no capital gains tax. Compared with other countries, it is also free from estate duty, inheritance and wealth tax, or foreign exchange controls. It is also regarded as a jurisdiction with highly skilled, bilingual and qualified pool of talents. 
It has a robust legal framework offering. The island has successfully exited the FATF grey list in 2021 and is now rated as compliant or largely compliant with 40 out of 40 FATF recommendations, reflecting the dedication of Mauritius to combat money laundering and terrorist financing. Being just around four hours flight away from South Africa, it offers a convenient time zone for, with 100% fiber optic coverage, beautiful natural environments, hotel and golf course, which you can see from our slides, and where pleasure can be blended with business. High net worth individuals and businessmen are looking for tailored and sophisticated services for special purpose takers, for asset protection, wealth preservation, enhanced return, and well-structured succession planning, which Mauritius offers. Foreign nationals may opt to invest, work, leave, and retire in Mauritius through various avenues, which Vera is going to take you through now. Now that we have covered why Mauritius is an attractive jurisdiction, and following on from one, what ANSI just summarized, there are various ways for an individual to apply to come work and live in Mauritius. The government of Mauritius has been working with the local regulators here to offer foreigners with various types of permit, depending on their specific requirements. All the permits that are available are linked to criteria which needs to be met. Uh, the first permit that we offer is the self-employed permit, and that, as the name says it, it is a self-employed permit, which is for one individual who can work in Mauritius, live and work in Mauritius. That self-employed individual needs to be tax registered in Mauritius. He needs to have his business registered in Mauritius as well with the Registrar of Businesses. Uh, there is a requirement for the individual to transfer in at least 35,000 USD into a Mauritian bank account. The permit is for 10 years and it is renewable. Um, also, there is a requirement for, for the permit to be renewable for the business to meet a, a generating revenue or turnover of at least 17,500 USD, which is roughly around 800,000 rupees as from the third year of training, of trading, sorry. An example of a self-employed permit holder may be um, a yoga trainer who currently operates out of South Africa. Now, if that individual wishes to move to Mauritius and work in Mauritius, he or she can move to Mauritius, register the business with the registrar here in Mauritius, find a studio, apply for the self-employed permit, and operate as a self-employed individual, as a yoga trainer, and uh, file the annual income tax returns and, and comply with the tax regulations here in Mauritius. We also offer the professional permit. That permit is linked to a company. It is for an individual who has an employment contract with a company here in Mauritius. The company must be registered here, incorporated in Mauritius, uh, tax registered in Mauritius, and the individual has to earn a salary of at least 30,000 rupees per month. That's uh, approximately $650 per month. The individual will also be paying his PAYE, file his annual tax return. The permit can be up, up for 10 years and also renewable. However, short-term permits are also provided depending on the um, on the requirement of the Mauritian company employing the individual. Um, this permit may apply to um, an individual who finds employment with a Mauritian company. So for example, there is um, an individual resident in the UK who, uh, who, who operates as a marketing uh, person and the Mauritian company needs a marketing director. That individual can come to Mauritius have an employment contract with the Mauritian company and also apply for the permit. So the, the, the individual is allowed to stay in Mauritius as long as he has a continuous employment with that company in Mauritius who wishes to employ him as an employee, as a marketing director. Mauritius also offers the investor permit option. The investor permit is uh, for an individual who wishes to come 
and, and invest at least 1% um, of the sharehold in the shareholding of a company in Mauritius. So that individual to be able to apply for the investor permit needs to be a 1% shareholder of a company, at least 1%, so it can be more than that. There is a requirement of uh, 50,000 USD to be transferred in, uh, in the company's bank account in Mauritius as the initial investment. Now that money, the funds that's transferred in, it's not locked in. Uh, it, 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 these funds are will be available. It can be used as part of the working capital of the company, or it can be withdrawn as well, depending on what the individual needs the funds for. I think what I'm trying to say here is the investment is not locked in or it's not paid to the regulators or the authorities. It stays in the company. The permit is for 10 years and it is uh, renewable. There is a requirement, however, for the company to be able to meet a turnover of about 4 million rupees in the first three years of trading. That's an equivalent of 87,000 USD. We also have the retiree permit. Now, the retiree permit is for any individual who is over 50 years of age who wishes to come and live in Mauritius. The criteria for that individual to be able to apply for the permit is uh, that he or she needs to transfer at least 1500 USD to a Mauritian bank account or an annual one off transfer of 18,000 USD. The retiree permit can be up to uh, 20 years, depending on the uh, eligibility of the individual and what else uh, is being. Uh, yeah, and all the criteria that are met. Sorry, I'm just looking at the chat box. I think there's no sound. Is Can everybody hear me? Um, I can hear you, no problem at all. Oh, okay, good. Sorry, I just saw a message coming in. Okay. All good. Great. Mauritius also um, introduced the concept of the premium travel visa permit. So it is, um, the premium travel visa is like an extended tourist visa. It was introduced about four years ago, just after the first phase of COVID. That's when people were start were actually allowed to start working remotely. So that became the norm. So the premium travel visa is, is valid for one year. And it is uh, for an individual who wishes to work in Mauritius and live in Mauritius for at least one year. Now, the requirement here is for that individual to have his return ticket. So we and also we need to demonstrate to the Mauritian government that you have enough funds to sustain yourself for the for the one year. Although working in Mauritius, the individual cannot earn any revenue from Mauritius. So it is working remotely out, lying by the pool or by the beach for at least a year here in the sunshine, but working for your company, you know, for a foreign company, but from Mauritius and not earning any revenue whatsoever here. Um, the last residency option that is being offered is via property acquisition. Now, this is a very common one, and it has been in existence for a few years now, for a good few years, actually. Um, and that's uh, now available via the property development scheme. It is the PDS scheme, as we call it um, in Mauritius. And it is eligible to any foreigner who wishes to purchase a, a property in Mauritius for uh, and, and the value of that property needs to be at least 375,000 USD and above. Now, as long as that property is held by the individual, that individual is allowed to live in Mauritius. So the residence permit is, is linked to the, to the flat, to the apartment, and, and you can live here and, and travel with the, the residency permit as well, but you get to come into the country at any point in time with the residency permit. Now, obviously, if the flat or the apartment is, is sold, then you lose the residency permit. And if the seller, if the buyer is a foreigner, then it gets transferred into the new buyer. I wish to add here that as a service provider, we do provide assistance with all these permit applications on a daily basis. And we do have lots of clients who shows interest in, um, in coming to work and live in Mauritius. Well, I have now covered all the various uh, various residency options that are available for uh, individuals to come and live in Mauritius, foreign individuals. I will now uh, dive into the, 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 
the different types of corporate solutions that we also offer um, for entities, for foreign entities. The, the business solutions, the most that, well, there are various types of companies that are available in Mauritius. Now, um, Mauritius does have double tax treaty agreements with approximately 46 countries in the, in the world. And with, uh, with these DTAs, with these tax treaties, and I, and I know Diane just mentioned us having a good tax treaty with South Africa as well. With the DTAs in place, certain companies in Mauritius are eligible to beneficial tax rates and reliefs, also rebates in Mauritius, depending on the criteria and, and, uh, and, and the substance requirements. Now, the normal tax rate in Mauritius is 15%. That's one five, 15% for companies. Um, there's also the concept of the partial exemption rate, which was introduced a few years ago. The partial exemption rate, abbreviated as PER, is 80%. So that 80% brings the effective tax rate to 3%. So all being well, if a company incorporated in Mauritius um, is compliant, uh, shows substance, it can actually benefit to a tax rate of 3%, depending on, on the criteria being met. I need to mention here that the partial exemption rate of 80% is applicable to certain revenue types and not all the revenues. So there are certain revenue streams which, uh, on which you can apply the, the partial exemption rate of 80% tax rebate. With that in mind, there are different types of companies as mentioned. So the first type of company I will cover is the Global Business License Company, abbreviated as a GBL company. It is one of the most common companies used by foreigners in Mauritius. It is a company which is registered here in Mauritius. It is tax resident in Mauritius. It needs to be centrally managed and controlled from Mauritius. All its board meetings needs to be chaired from Mauritius. Therefore, it is required to have at least two Mauritian directors. Um, the, the tax rate, the, the tax rate for a GBL is usually 15%. However, depending on, on, the, on its eligibility and its uh, revenue activity, it can actually um, benefit from other tax treaties and also tax rebates depending on, uh, on if it is eligible to the partial exemption rate, for example. Now, a GBL company, a global business license company, can be a trading company. So it can buy and sell commodities in Mauritius. It can be an import and export entity as well. So it can import goods like fabrics from China and sell it to the UK, for example. And um, it can also be an investment holding entity. Um, I think it is uh, worth highlighting here that an import and export company in Mauritius is taxed at a flat rate of 3%. So that's, uh, it, it uh, doesn't matter what type of a company you are, if it, you are in the import and export business, you are eligible to the 3% tax rate. Uh, I'll now go through a quick um, example of how a GBL can work in Mauritius in practice. Um, so if I use an existing company, for example, operating out of Mozambique, um, and that company can be an operating company in, um, in agriculture, in farming, for example. So it can be growing bananas or macadamias or lychees in Mozambique. The shareholders or the board of that Mozambican company can consider setting up a GBL company here in Mauritius. The GBL company can act as the sole shareholder of the Mozambican company. So the shares held in Mozambique are transferred to the GBL company in Mauritius, whereby the sole shareholder is now the GBL company. And as the sole shareholder, the company here in Mauritius will be earning dividends, foreign dividends, from the revenue of the Mozambican company. Now, foreign dividends in Mauritius is taxed at 3% as it is eligible to the partial exemption rate of 80%. However, another benefit of this scenario is where the double tax treaties also uh, apply. So if withholding taxes have been suffered 
on the foreign dividends being declared in Mozambique, then that withholding tax can be, um, you can get that as a rebate in Mauritius, basically. It can be offset against your tax liability here in Mauritius. Now, from what I know and what I've seen lately, I think the taxes, the withholding taxes on dividends in Mozambique is around 20%. And the tax rate here in Mauritius is 3%. The effective tax rate on the foreign dividends will be 3%. Therefore, that company will be eligible to, um, to get a relief for the withholding taxes already suffered in Mozambique and may very likely not pay any taxes here in Mauritius if, uh, you know, if all the paperwork are in place and you can actually prove to the Mauritian authority that those taxes, the withholding taxes were suffered at source in Mozambique. So this is where, um, this is how a GBL will work as an investment holding company, also benefiting from the DTAs, the double tax treaties that we have in place, and also the partial exemption rates. We also have the concept of an authorized company in Mauritius. Now that's a different type of company. It is registered in Mauritius. However, it is quite different to a GBL whereby it is not meant to be centrally managed and controlled from Mauritius. Therefore, uh, the directors needs to be sitting outside of Mauritius. It needs to be controlled and be run outside of Mauritius. It is required to file an annual tax return with the, the Mauritian Revenue Authority in Mauritius. That's to prove to the MRA, to the Mauritian Revenue Authority, that it is not operating from Mauritius and it is um, resident somewhere else you know, in the world. Now, um, as a service provider, we provide uh, our CMC, as we call it, we provide the centrally manage, management and control of such an entity uh, from Seychelles. So we have people sitting in Seychelles who act as directors and service providers, and they, um, they actually control the company from Seychelles and has a registered office there as well. Um, now, to, to help you understand this scenario, this, this authorized company a little bit better, I will use an example of, of a consultant. Um, say, for example, a consultant currently operating from, uh, from, from, from France, for example, and that individual is looking to come to set up an offshore company to benefit better uh, in terms of taxes and, 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 and income as well. So that individual can set up uh, an authorized company. The, the individual can act as the sole director. He can also control the company from France. So um, he can set up a consultancy service services registered here in Mauritius, which is either managed from Seychelles, where we provide our control and management, or the, indivi the French individual can do it himself out of France. But then again, in his country of uh, residence, the, the French individual may have to look um, at his or her own tax uh, requirements and implications, but it can be done. So the, the, the individual can manage the, the authorized company from his country of residence and be the sole director as well. An authorized company is a 0% tax company. So there is no taxes paid in Mauritius. It is 0% tax as long as you can demonstrate that it is tax residence somewhere else uh, and, and being managed out of Mauritius, uh, you can benefit from the 0% tax. We also have the domestic company in Mauritius. Now, the domestic company is a local, local entity. It will be like a normal PTY in South Africa. It's a company resident in Mauritius. It's tax resident as well in Mauritius. It can be 100% foreign owned. However, the activity of the domestic company must be in Mauritius. So it needs to service the local market. Um, an example will be a wine wholesaler or a wine retailer operating out of South Africa who wishes to service the local market in Mauritius can set up a domestic company in Mauritius, be tax resident in Mauritius, and, and obtain the right liquor licenses because it is liquor, you will need a separate license. 
but that individual can set up the company here and, and sell wine to the local market. So that will be a domestic company. The, the revenue of that domestic company must be derived from Mauritius. Mauritius also has uh, lots of special licenses. So there were many companies in Mauritius which are set up as funds, investment dealers, investment brokers, PCCs, variable capital companies as well. Um, these special licenses, uh, the, the application itself is quite rigorous. It's, it's, it, it can be cumbersome, but the Financial Services Commission does provide those licenses to entities who can actually provide the right documentation, the manuals, and all the legal documents required. There is a list of requirements for each and every special license that is offered by uh, the Mauritian Financial Services Commission. We need to provide manuals like AML manuals, the compliance manuals, internal control manuals, and, and the PPMs as well with the application to the FSC. There are also requirements whereby we need to employ people in Mauritius. So there must be people on the ground for these special license to be uh, to be granted by the FSC in Mauritius. Namely, uh, the CEO, the CFO, sometimes the MLRO, the, DP, the, the data protection officer, the DPO, and also the compliance officer needs to be employed here by these entities to prove that they are eligible to the special licenses. There's also higher license fees uh, attached to these special licenses, but all in all, if uh, all the documents are provided with the right documentation, the right legal uh, manuals and all that, the FSC is very keen to uh, issue these licenses. And I'm glad to say that we do have an expert team here as well. We actually specialize in these special licenses and we have many such clients in Mauritius via us ourselves in Rogers Capital. I will now hand over to ANSI, who will take you through some uh, foreign companies that we offer as well as part of the service offerings. And also she will talk you through estate planning uh, options in Mauritius and how we can assist you. Thank you, Vera. This is a lot of interesting information. Stay with me as we delve into the next part covering international business company, family office, estate planning, trust and foundations, and I will briefly also pass on insurance policies, which uh, Diane also highlighted in her slide, in her presentation earlier. So let me start with an international business company, commonly known as IBC. It is a legal entity with limited liability, formed under the laws of some select jurisdiction. IBCs can be used for international trading, international consultancy services, property holdings, IP right holdings, and yield and shipping holdings. Some IBCs are fully tax exempt in the country of their registration. The advantage of an IBC is of incorporating an IBC is fast, affordable, and a simple process. It can have at least one director, has no statutory audit requirement or no minimal capital requirement for non-licensed IBCs. It can have bank accounts in various jurisdictions and currencies, including facilitating international trade and finance. It is exchange control exempt, and it provides for confidentiality as well as asset protection. An IBC can be redomiciled in other the jurisdiction. Directors' meeting can be held within or outside the country of registration. The formation of an IBC is carried out by a licensed management corporate and also provide for registered office and registered agent services. Common jurisdiction providing IBC services are Hong Kong, British Virgin Islands, UAE, and the Seychelles, among others. I will now move on to my next topic, which is family office. A very interesting one. High net worth individuals and ultra high net worth families have a lot of complexity to manage across their assets, activities, relationships, and many dimensions of their lives. There is endless amount of 
or to organize, to direct, to plan ahead. This is particularly true for families aiming to build a substantial vibrant family enterprise that they wish to perpetrate for generations. Fortunately, there is a structure that reduces this complexity and provides efficiencies across the family, breadth of assets and activities. This is the family office. Of course, there is no one size fits all. Each family office should be tailored with the services, team, scale, and that the family needs. There are primarily two common types of family offices, single family office and multiple family office. Any person carry out, carrying out a family office activity from Mauritius shall have no clients other than the family clients. Can extend to the wealth structure, such as the clients, the trusts, the foundation companies, or partnership, all other similar structures. Family offices are regulated by the Mauritius Financial Services Commission and should comply with the regulatory and licensing conditions. Asset under management must be greater than $5 million. There is a minimum of one staff for single family office and three staff requirement for multiple family office. Each family office shall at all time have designated reporting officer, a money laundering reporting officer and deputy money laundering officer as approved by the regulator. The required fully paid minimum stated unimpaired capital is US dollar 35,000 for single family office and US dollar 70,000 for multiple family office. Setting up a family office in Mauritius will benefit easy access to robust and existing pool of professionals, bank, tax advisors, lawyers, wealth managers on the island. It is worth noting that in view of promoting family office in Mauritius, the government offers a 10-year tax holiday for family offices meeting substance criteria. In addition, in the 2024 and 2025 budget, it was noted that a 10-year expert occupation permit will be introduced to attract foreign talents into wealth management and family office. Mauritius, as an international financial center, is keen to promote family offices in Mauritius and offers all the various facilities that goes along with it. I will now move on to estate planning, and I'm glad that when I listen to Dan's uh, uh, presentations earlier, she touched on this and the importance of estate planning. Why is estate planning important? To ensure that loved ones are protected and that wealth accumulated over years or through legacy or passed on the way intended, a comprehensive estate plan is very important. Many financial advisors will recommend starting an estate plan the moment someone starts accumulating wealth become legal adult or that key milestones, for example, when you're getting married, divorce, or acquiring an asset or diversifying investment outside the country. We have seen earlier all the different benefits offered in Mauritius and the range of SPVs through which investors can invest offshore, accumulate wealth, wealth outside of South Africa. And I think Dan has touch on these as well, the importance of estate planning and, and the tax consequences and the tax benefit of it. A key step to complete the whole structuring would be to house a diversified investment under a trust. A trust is a useful tool for estate planning in a, as, as we have explained earlier. In a trust, rights either personal or proprietary are held by one person for the benefit of the other. The person creating the trust is called the settler, the person holding the rights is a trustee, and the person for whom those rights are held is a beneficiary. While there are different types of trust, an intervivals trust is a great way to manage assets and ensure that people and causes cared about most are provided for. An intervivals trust is established during the lifetime of the person establishing the trust. 
there are two main types of intervival stress. It can be revocable or irrevocable. Revocable stress will allow for changes and uh, including for the beneficiaries, trustees, what assets are included, instruction for the asset distribution. An irrevocable trust cannot be changed unless beneficiaries signed off on the modifications. There are various advantages that the trust provides. We have seen the tax advantages which Dan highlighted. There is also the process, the probate process, which can be a long and expensive one, depending on the size of your estate. Assets transferred to a trust can be transferred directly to your beneficiaries without going through probate, saving them time, money, and hassle. The probate process makes details about an estate public, including assets own their value, the beneficiaries. Because trust assets don't go through probate, this information remains private. A trust gives greater control over how and when assets are distributed to beneficiaries. For example, to pay for education costs, for travels, and for any special needs of a beneficiary. Mauritius, offers a, Mauritius Trust offers a lot of advantages. In Mauritius, the current legal framework for trust is the Trust Act 2001. Every trust must have a qualified trustee authorized by the Financial Services Commission. The duration of a trust is limited to maximum of 99 years. There are no registration or filing requirements for the trust in Mauritius and access and disclosure of information are limited. However, they are subject to FATCA and COS as, as applicable. The details of trust are disclosed by order of the Mauritian Supreme Court. An estate may be preserved from an attack from creditors. Any professional negligence claims or insolvency of the settler. In the case of a settler's bankruptcy or liquidation, a merchant trust will, be, will not be void or voidable. Also, false headship rule can be avoided if assets are held in a trust. The trust can be migrated to another jurisdiction should the financial need arise. Another similar vehicle to a trust, which is commonly used for asset protection and estate planning, is a foundation. To create a foundation, ownership of the relevant asset is transferred to the founder, foundation by the founder. The foundation itself will hold rights, and the person for whom these rights will be held is a beneficiary. The foundation will be managed by one or more members of the council who will have extensive powers to manage the affairs of the foundation. Council members will also be subject to duties similar to that of a company director. Generally, a will will be like the starting point to our estate planning. A will takes effect upon death and will lead to immediate direct disposition of assets to heirs of the death of the testator, whereas a trust and a foundation takes effect at the time of its creation, but the assets do not pass to the beneficiary directly. Trusts and foundations are immutable on fixed in, and all fixed in time, as opposed to a will. They provide flexibility and they can adapt to changing conditions and circumstances. Trust and foundations can accommodate philanthropic causes more easily. It would be a good idea to have a pour over will. This helps to ensure property not already included in a trust is pour over into the trust at death and distributed accordingly to the deceased wishes. Finally, allow me to conclude on the importance of life insurance policies in an estate planning. I'm glad to see that Diane has also passed on it in her presentation. And nowadays we are seeing that it is becoming very important to review life insurance policies to ensure that they are up to date and that beneficiaries are correct.
Life insurance policies can provide a significant amount of financial support to families after the passing of the policyholder. A life insurance policy with no beneficiary will not be paid to the deceased estate and will be subject will be paid to the excuse me will be paid to the deceased estate and will be subject to estate duty. There are various advantages in adding a trust as a beneficiary of a life insurance policy. Or uh, and of short trust. I think Diane also explained the difference between having the policy in an offshore trust or a local trust. And offshore uh, trusts such as intervivors trust can be used or even freezer trust when you can just have your a trust set up to uh, uh, make it a beneficiary of your uh, life insurance policy. And it is only at the time the policy is paid that the trust becomes uh, an, uh, like a life trust and start uh, managing the assets for the beneficiaries. After just capital, we partner with wealth managers, insurance brokers, and uh, tax advisors so that we can work on a bespoke cost-effective solution for the clients. So feel free to contact us should you need some structuring guidance. On this, we will conclude and allow for questions. And see, Vera, thank you so much. Um, it, it's such a lot of critically important information. And I, I think um, your points around estate planning are really well made. And your point around bespoke solutions is to me the most important point for our advisors to listen to. Colleagues, a lot of questions are coming in around um, general structuring, thoughts on jurisdictions. I want to urge you to get in touch with the likes of Ansi and Vera and ask them questions as and when these are specific to your clients. So you can sketch your clients' personal circumstances. They can help you structure something for that client. A lot of questions, uh, Vera, in response to your example around Mozambique, people want to know, so how is it that you get the money out? I love that idea. And I want to again invite our, our audience to please speak to you guys in person. I've had the benefit, colleagues, of speaking to the guys at, at Rogers on specific client advisory situations. Similarly, I've engaged Di before. So please, these, amongst all the other professionals out there, are the guys I want to urge you to, to talk to. Again, the context within which you ask is so, so very important. From a logistics perspective, I've seen a number of people ask, where are the slides? Where are the notes? As Sandra answered, we will share these afterwards. We've officially run out of time. So I'm going to urge you to please contact our speakers if you have client-specific or general questions. Their details will be made available again on the stuff that we'll share. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you so much again to our presenters. Really informative. Really appreciate your participation this morning. Thanks, guys. Until the next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.